낯익은 얼굴의 오늘의 강사 누군지 기억하시나요? 국내의 한 발효유 광고에 출연해 위건강을 강조했던 베리 마셜 그는 위염과 위궤양의 원인인 헬리코박터균을 발견하고 유해성을 입증한 세계적인 석학입니다. 그 공로로 노벨상도 받았죠. 마셜 박사의 연구는 강한 위산에서는 세균이 살수 없다는 의학계의 오랜 통념을 깼습니다. 덕분에 인류의 고질병인 여러 위장질환과 위암까지 조기 발견하고 치료할 수 있게 됐습니다. 헬리코박터균의 유해성을 밝힌 지 40년. 오늘 그를 다시 만납니다. Hello, EBS viewers, once again, and welcome to We Day Han Swap, Great Minds. Yes, I'm Barry Marshall, Professor of Clinical Microbiology at the University of Western Australia in Perth. And so I'm going to continue the talk today as we discuss the implications of Helicobacter and its linkage to gastric cancer. So we last discussed the fact that many people have asymptomatic Helicobacter, no symptoms, and they can be infected with Helicobacter their whole life and not know it. But these people do have chronic gastritis their whole life and are particularly susceptible to developed gastric cancer. So how does that happen? Well, we think it's caused by bone marrow cells invading the gastric mucosa. And this is a study published a few years ago in Science by Jean-Marie Houghton and Professor Wang in Boston. So what does that mean? It means that all your life you are having irritation, inflammation and damage to the lining of your stomach, even if you can't feel anything. And that damage is being repaired by stem cells that have come from the bone marrow. They're floating past in the blood. They see some damage in the stomach. They go in and they try to repair it. Things happen in the stomach over many years. One of them is intestinal metaplasia. And so the, the, the lining of the stomach starts to look like the intestine. It's no longer gastric type. So intestinal metaplasia is a marker. And that is very common to find in Asian people with Helicobacter pylori, particularly Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans. So intestinal metaplasia probably comes from stem cells which float past originally from the bone marrow. The other thing that can happen is ultimately the acid secreting part of the stomach gets damaged, the acid level goes way down and we have what's called gastric atrophy and that is a very high risk lesion for stomach cancer. And so we can kind of predict which patients might develop stomach cancer or might be likely to develop stomach cancer, but generally it's older people who have had helicobacter all their lives uh, are the ones that we have to worry about. So maybe not young people in Korea quite so much these days, but their parents, your parents, might be the people at risk of stomach cancer and so should be tested for H. pylori and nearly everybody in Korea should have an endoscopy probably by the age of 40 or 50 just to see what's happening. So this unveiled a new mechanism for carcinogenesis, what causes some cancers. And certainly inflammation, the repair process, stem cells coming in to repair, and maybe the influence of carcinogens, all those things add up to develop cancers. So what cancers might be important here? Well, the ones that I know of are stomach cancer, liver cancer, cervical cancer, and there may be others. But you know, in Asia, particularly Japan, Korea, and China, these cancers are very common, stomach cancer and liver cancer. They used to be the top number one and number two 
uh, cancers in these countries. Now, luckily, stomach cancer is getting coming down, so we're eradicating the Helicobacter pylori. The diet is a little bit better. Liver cancer, uh, people are taking vaccination against hepatitis B, so we should be able to get rid of that one. Cervical cancer, that's going to be controlled by a, a vaccine, and maybe there are others. So the future looks bright in that so many people who could have developed cancer are going to be protected by modern medicine. We're getting on now to more information about Helicobacter pylori treatment, and the concern has been that H. pylori, as we say, is becoming resistant to antibiotics. It's in some ways becoming a superbug. And nowadays when we treat patients against Helicobacter pylori with different antibiotics, the cure rate is falling. So the cure rate used to be 95%. And in the last few years, it's getting down towards 80%. So that means quite often the patient will have to have several different treatments. The patient could already have a resistant Helicobacter pylori even before you start treatment. So if you knew that information, uh, you would be able to say, we, we, can, we cannot use those particular antibiotics. We have to use some special ones, perhaps. So we like to culture H. pylori to see which antibiotics will kill it. Now, there's a very trendy saying in medicine. It's called precision medicine. So in the 20th century, the government and doctors would say, OK, on average, we give everybody the same treatment. We give this treatment and they'll save a lot of money, and most of the time it works. So that was the 20th century plan. But the 21st century plan is going to be precision medicine. Whenever we try to treat something in a patient, we study the patient very carefully, carefully. we study the disease, and in this case, we want to study the H. pylori, and then we want to find out which are the best antibiotics for each person to kill their own H. pylori. So just now I'd like to go into more detail with the cancer issue and how Helicobacter pylori is important. And this is a study described by Dr. Taramatsu's group in the Aichi Cancer Research Institute in Japan. And you'll see that they took Mongolian gerbils and fed them different diets and carcinogens and H. pylori to see if they would develop stomach cancer. You'll see the animals were just given a high salt diet, sodium chloride. None of them developed cancer and none of them developed antibodies against H. pylori, as you would expect. If they had a Helicobacter pylori infection, again, they didn't develop cancer, but they did develop some antibodies. So if they had H. pylori infection and a high salt diet, then no cancer yet, but quite high antibody level. So that means the inflammation seems to be stronger if you have H. pylori and a high, high salt diet. Then they gave some animals a carcinogen, MNU, and again, nothing much happened. MNU plus sodium chloride, that's in the row labelled C. And you'll see that, uh, again, nothing much happened. But MNU, a carcinogen in the diet, with Helicobacter pylori, you'll see for the first time about 15% of those animals developed a carcinoma and also had high antibody levels shown in B. Carcinogen plus H. pylori plus a high salt diet, that leads to 30 or 40% rate of stomach cancer in those animals and the antibody titer is much higher. And then finally, you can see the bad combination. So the message is that if you have H. pylori, other things that damage the st stomach are much stronger, much worse. So a helicobacter makes everything else worse. For instance, high salt diet 
or a carcinogen. And so that people who have helicobacter all their life, whenever they have a little bit of carcinogen or too much salt or something, it's just going to potentiate the H. pylori effect and raise the risk of carcinoma. So in the 20th century, everybody got the same treatment. Everybody was average. All people were supposed to be the same but we could not really get the cure rate up high enough with that kind of strategy. Now in 21st century, we are using a lot of high technology and the catchword is personalized medicine, precision medicine. And so everybody's not the same, everybody is different. Each person wants to have novel technology, precision diagnosis, specific therapy and personalized medicine. Now, when we do this, we're going to have less antibiotic use. We can have shorter courses of antibiotics. And hopefully, we won't get this proliferation of antibiotic-resistant superbugs, which have become such a problem in our hospitals in the 20th century. So in summary, these antibiotics can be used several times. Helicobacter pylori never becomes resistant to these, or at least it's very, very rare. So bismuth is very harmless. In a two-week course, doesn't have any serious side effects or anything. Uh, amoxicillin, you have all used amoxicillin, so apart from amoxicillin allergy, uh, amoxicillin is still very, very useful, and you can use it for future H. pylori therapies. If the H. pylori fails treatment with amoxicillin, you can still use it again, or bismuth, you can still use it again in combination with some other antibiotics. Tetracycline is another one, so tetracycline resistance is very rare and you can probably use tetracycline in several different treatments. So just remember you can reuse these antibiotics and you would then add another antibiotic which the H. pylori is sensitive to and you would use a strong PPI drug if possible. So here's the rule, choose these drugs only once, that's metronidazole and clarithromycin and quinolones and rifamycin such as rifabutin, rifaximin. So H. pylori always becomes resistant to these. So why does H. pylori become resistant to these drugs so quickly, maybe even after the first day or so of treatment? And the reason is because H. pylori does not check its DNA when it divides. So if it has errors in its DNA, for instance, if it just has random mutations in certain genes, uh, the H. pylori doesn't care. It still divides and will grow into another organism. So you get random mutations around in the H. pylori genome. Certain enzymes become inactivated, and therefore the, the best example being metronidazole. The metronidazole is no longer metabolized into the toxic form, and so the organism is now resistant to metronidazole. So that means that because of its high mutation rate, H. pylori quickly becomes resistant to these antibiotics. And that is why uh, you really have to use them in combinations and you don't use them again. So we don't fear the H. pylori anymore. We're going to eradicate it, not only in Korea, but in the whole world. So I talked about some new techniques that we're developing, made it less expensive. Uh, new antibiotics, new acid blockers that are going to make it a lot easier for everybody to uh, eradicate the H. pylori. Now, as we understand the H. pylori, we know that there are still many, many other organisms of interest in the gastrointestinal tract, and there are many diseases we don't understand very well. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, colitis, or Crohn's disease, irritable bowel affects about 5 to 10% of the population in Australia and probably also in Korea. So everybody is interested in these other diseases and interested in how perhaps the genome and the microbiome and the microbiota and the gut ecology can affect these other conditions.